Hello, everyone. Welcome to another binary episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre with me as Z, who I'll let get into the Spot the Volume Challenge of the Week before we jump into our topics. And just jumping right into that, this week's Spot the Volume is um, hopefully a fairly easy one for most of you. Um, at least if you come on the AppSec side of things. Um, we've got check log, and so I actually did take this from a web application hacker's handbook. I think the code's pretty much exactly from there. But it is a it's a common enough situation, perhaps not in a login, but elsewhere. So what you've got is this check login function. It's just grabbing username, password, tries to look up the user from the database if they can't find it. Or if, sorry, um, yeah, if they can't find it, returns to, you know, go do the login page again or whatever. Or it'll log them in successfully. It's looking up the username with the username password. We don't really see any of the crypto there. There are some hidden details. But the key thing is that that first block from getting the parameters down through um, uh, accessing the database to get the user, that is all inside of just a try catch block, which just has a very generic exception catcher, uh, catches every exception and does absolutely nothing with it. Classic case of a fail open situation where if you can cause some exception to happen somewhere in that state it'll let you log in successfully uh so in this case i was just looking for people to spot the vulnerability here actually explain this could be a little bit tricky because we don't know exactly what get users doing anywhere that we could cause an exception to happen but it's still you know want those patterns to kind of be aware of and look for uh, so those generic exception handlers are pretty common honestly um Ideally, you jump out of the entire flow. Uh, you'll have something a bit earlier on or higher in the uh, call chain. But um, yeah, I mean, it is something I have seen just not so much in the login system like this one. Uh, but it's out there. Nobody wants to deal with error handling. So, you know, it's it's easy to find like lazy mistakes or, or something like that with them because people just don't want to deal with it. It's annoying. It's not fun. Not rewarding. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so we'll jump into our topics, and uh, this episode has a bit of a theme to it this week, and that theme is Apple. Um, almost all the topics we have are, are based on attacking Apple products uh, or Apple code. And we'll start off with uh, an easier one, which is an iPod boot ROM exploit, um, which targets the iPod Nano third to fifth generation, which is, you know, pretty old. Um, I think way back I, I had like a an iPod fourth gen, uh, iPod Nano fourth gen, but... Yeah, obviously pretty old device, not exactly the uh, cutting edge of the security landscape. Um, but surprisingly, it didn't have a public exploit until now past the iPod Nano 4G. So that was part of the motivation uh, of why they looked at it. And uh, the post goes on to first give some background on what's involved with the iPod. Um, for example, he thought it might be running like some early prototype of XNU, but it's it's just running like a small real-time operating system. Um, and even back then there, there was some security in the boot chain. Uh, so, you know, they had signatures, the boot run would verify the second stage loader and the second stage loader would verify the OS and everything else that gets loaded. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a little bit going on there. Uh, thanks to some prior work, they were able to get dumped boot ROM contents and the decrypted firmware, which is one of the barriers to entry of doing this kind of research generally. Um, because you know, if the firmware is encrypted or if it's just difficult to get in the case of the boot ROM because it's burned into the chip, um, it can kind of limit your research. But luckily, they they had a foothold for that already. Um, and yeah, they started reversing the boot ROM. They found a bug in the USB stack because, you know, uh, what else would it be other than the USB stack? It's just kind of the classic attack surface to go to. Um, there they'd found a USB driver would uh, parse the setup request packets, and if the request type was 3, it would take an attacker-controlled index value to index into an array of uh, function handlers with no bounds checking. So, pretty trivial out-of-bounds access, which that value that's pulled from the array is, you know, used to execute code since it's a function pointer. Um, so they get code exec right away, basically. Uh, what they did there was they set the instruction pointer to an ARM gadget that would branch to R0, which because of where they were attacking, ended up pointing to their uh, request buffer of contents they controlled. Uh, and, you know, where this is such an old device, there's no NX in play or anything. So they were able to put shell code directly in the request packet, uh, use the branch to R0 gadget to get there, and then they got, you know, 
pretty stable code execution. So not a super complicated vulnerability or exploit chain, but it is targeting an interesting device. Uh, you know, one of those older boot ROMs. Um, and like I said, I think the, the more complicated stuff is more in the initial research as opposed to, you know, the exploitation angle of it. Um, so it's cool to have a bit of the background info on that as well. Yeah, uh, exploit's pretty straightforward, but it's a fun little bug. I mean, kind of a, cl- well, a rather nice because it is going for a function pointer, but out of bounds access. Not a lot too special there. Um, in fact, he even calls it out as being it's such a trivial bug. He didn't even notice it at first. Like, wouldn't make that mistake. I mean, I think he said at one point that he had to, like, take a look at it again because he was almost sure. Like, it seemed too easy, even for a device of that time. So yeah, it was kind of funny. Um Something else that I thought I'd point out, it's not really relevant for the exploitation, but uh, they are actively working on getting like Linux and U-Boot ported uh, to the Nano 5G. They actually show a bit of a snippet towards the end of getting the kernel running in a, a basic init RAMFS, and that's ongoing work in progress. So if you want some interesting project to work on that might be interesting to you, they call out that they welcome some contribution. Um, there's some instructions on how to join their matrix and, and Libra and stuff at the bottom. But yeah, I mean, it's a cool device to target. Uh, obviously, it's it's not a powerhouse of processing power or anything like that. But uh, yeah, it's just cool to attack older devices like that. And Balika said this bug is exactly the same as MT- MTK boot ROM exploit. Yeah, um, that's not surprising. Like when I think of all the bootloader bugs I've seen published and written up over the last years, I can't think of very many that weren't in the USB stack. Uh, like I, I'm pretty sure check rain was basically, uh, the media tech one, this one, like it's just such a USB is hard to get right, I guess. Uh, and it's just such a big attack surface. So I suppose since it's doing the pro or since it's doing the parsing there, like it's an attack surface, it's a rather large attack surface. When, when you're talking about the bootloader, you don't have a lot. You don't have the drivers. You don't have a lot of, um, access there i guess you don't have a lot of attack surface yeah uh Beliga mentioned i've yet to see an android phone with any kind of anti-exploit protection in the boot rom most phones have at least stack cookies and bootloaders not in the rom though yeah so i guess like for those who aren't too familiar with boot roms it is kind of an interesting case where there's a lot more trade-offs that you have to make right um because the boot rom code is burned into the chip you are more limited on like the size of the binary, for example, like you want to keep it as small as possible. Um, you also have limited capability when it comes to things like uh, like virtual addressing and, and things like that. Like it's, it's you don't really have it at that stage. So to be fair, like it is difficult to do mitigations at that level. And because it's such a like difficult subsystem to hit from like an unprivileged context, like you need a pretty high privilege to be able to even hit the boot ROM in the first place, right? So I can kind of understand why there isn't as many exploit mitigations there. Um, but you know, it is a fair call out. Uh, it's one of those systems where it might be hard to find a bug because your attack surface is small. Uh, you don't have a lot of vectors into it. But if you can find a bug in it, then, you know, it's like the egg eggshell thing where it's it's kind of hard to get in. But once you have a bug, it's pretty easy to take it all the way. So and thanks, uh, Simi Seven for the uh, Twitch Prime sub. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, uh, also the Switch. Yeah, the Switch was a USB bug too. Okay. I don't know how I forgot that one. So yeah, cool, cool topic, but a uh, pretty trivial vulnerability. Getting into a much more complicated vulnerability, we have an XNU post uh, uh, or an XNU bug report that was detailed by Project Zero um, coming out of Ian Beer. So I'll let Z get into this one. Yeah, and this one is kind of cool. Um, yeah, I, I really like this bug. It's it's not exactly a memory corruption, but can result in memory corruption. And it is fairly deep inside of the XM, XNU virtual memory. So as you can see from the title here, XNU virtual memory, Opion right bypass. Uh, so definitely an interesting area to see a bug. And it starts off with basically a differential or sort of desync between two of the uh, code paths. Uh, when doing a large uh, copy, ultimately it comes in, it's got this uh, VM map copy overwrite, and it'll 
end up jumping into either an aligned or an aligned copy or the unaligned version. And these two versions have a in code, if you're looking at this, a kind of obvious difference between them. Both of them are looking at, you know, this entry has this needs copy flag. That's basically your copy on write protection. It's saying, you know, if you want to write here, you need the copy. So that's for this exploit, like that's always going to be set. So we're talking about the copy on write pages. Um, and then if it has that or an aligned copy, it just goes and creates a shadow entry, flips the copy because it's made a shadow. And carries on with the copy. With the aligned one, though, it does it does that same check. It creates a shadow, but it only creates a shadow with this extra condition here, where it checks the protection flags, uh, looking for writable. So it only does that if the page is actually writable, and then it carries on with the copy, which kind of creates a case where if you could get a case where you're passing a page that has the copy on write but is not writable, you're able to write to the original page because it doesn't create the shadow. That said, that's harder to get than you might, or you would probably expect that to be fairly hard to get to. Um, and in this case, there is. There's another function that's uh, higher on the call chain than this, that when you do have this, uh, when you have a copy that's going across pages, it's going to go through the entire address space. I don't even think it cares about pages for this. It just looks at the pages for the address space. Uh, basically iterates through and checks, you know, does it have right flag? If it doesn't, I'm going to unlock and return a protection failure. So you shouldn't be able to do this, but what ends up happening is there's a bit of a race condition in this one also, in that when it is iterating through doing the actual copy, um, during the actual copy, it basically ends up unlocking and relocking itself between calls to the uh, VM fault copy function. And in that period, you can end up having that flag flipped, leading to the case of, uh, or leading to the situation where you end up having your write actually uh, not have a shadow copy, not get copied when you write, but write to the original page that everybody else using the same uh, copy on write page is going to see. So you're able to basically broadcast it out to all these other applications, uh, provided you can actually flip that flag. So I thought it's a really cool bug. They don't have a full working exploit here. He talks about like, this should be exploitable and, you know, has a bit of a hacky proof of concept for it. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, like copy on write, like when you fork a process, uh, you're going to have a copy on write there. Uh, it's not going to copy all the pages when you fork. It's just going to basically share the page a bit until you try and write something and change something. So there's a lot of places where these copy on write pages exist, a lot of potential for exploitation, but definitely a little bit tricky, especially when you do need to be able to flip the flag. Uh, but I think it's a really cool bug nonetheless. Um, like it took me a little bit to kind of get it, and there are definitely details I don't get, but yeah, it's fun to see this sort of just race condition and not even like a proper memory corruption yet. Of course, if you can write to those pages, that is a memory corruption like everywhere else. Everywhere else using it, that is. It's also a pretty uh, interesting and uncommon primitive. Um, yeah. Like it is it is one you can almost certainly take advantage of, as Aaron Beer notes, like a, a lot of security sensitive contexts rely on copy on write. Uh, it's kind of one of those fundamental building blocks of the system. Um, but yeah, like it's one of those bugs where you could only really find it doing manual review, I think, because there's no immediate obvious side effect. You have to put a good bit of effort into setting up a scenario that makes it useful and, and does something. Um, so yeah, like I, I doubt you could really find this fuzzing, really, unless you got extremely lucky and you had some really good sanitizers or something like that. And it's um, not violating anything. Like it's not. Yeah. Like ASAN isn't going to catch that. You're not doing. No, you would have to have a custom sanitizer. You, yeah, you would need some that's looking specifically for this, really. Um, I guess, you know, having some that's looking for rights to copy on right pages, but then you already kind, kind of know what the bug is and you're just detecting that. Like, I can't think of a generic way where you'd catch this. This is very much just a desync and a logic error um, that results in this. But 
you know, at super low level. Usually when we're talking about the bugs and seeing stuff, it's not this sort of bug. That's another thing that I like. But yeah, it's it's something that, you know, the way to kind of detect, and I'm not saying I would have caught it, uh, but is noticing this difference, the semantic difference between how these two operate. In that there is that extra condition, then going in there and looking, can you violate this assumption? And if you just look at the code, you might even think you couldn't because you do see it locking and doing that access and checking all all the entries for that flag. So you know, it, it is a bit tricky to even discover even doing the code review. Yeah, you, you can't help but respect like the amount of effort and the amount of skill it would take the researcher to find this kind of bug. And, you know, it's Ian Beer, so that's that's nothing new. I mean, he's been doing this kind of stuff and finding amazing bugs for years. Um, but yeah, like this is one of those things where you would need a lot of fundamental understanding of the subsystem, in this case, the, the virtual memory uh, management stuff to be able to catch it and figure out how to exploit it. So, so yeah. Turn exploit says you can look for modified read only files. Um, I mean, when we're dealing with the memory pages, not just read-only files, I mean, I guess things kind of get back, like, everything's a file on the UX, but, um, I, I don't think you'd really catch up with that. Like, this is at a bit of a lower level, since this is at, like, the memory management system itself. Um, and kind of a side note, I guess, uh, when you do flip the page, there is a check for, um, I guess, yeah, mmapped files. Uh, there is a uh, there is one check that does check if it's been modified uh, between those locks, although it only really checks that in the sense of see so timestamp. If it has changed, it just reloads. It doesn't do the precondition checks. Um, as for current X, I guess fishing on that. Um, I mean, that could catch some of them. Again, you kind of know what you're going for then. Like, that kind of knows the bug ahead of time. Um, although, I guess you could generically do that. Fair, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the way I'd put it is, like, it could work. But in reality, setting that up in a fuzzer to, like, try to sanitize would not be easy. And you would, yeah, you would have, have to be specifically targeting bugs like this. Um, so, you know, it's a fair, a shout, fair but, thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so yeah, pretty interesting bug. Uh, ultimately boils down to a race, but yeah, it is more of that logic level. All right, so uh, we have another Project Zero post here, uh, which is a WebKit uh, vulnerability, a, a UAF and WebKit that was reported by Maddie Stone at Project Zero. And interestingly, this one was in DOM uh, and CSS crossfade value crossfade change. And it's a surprisingly straightforward bug, relatively speaking. Uh, so... The parent class that uh, CSS crossfade value extends, being CSS image generator value, will keep this hash counted set of clients for the image um, and just keep that in a list to, to keep track of everything. And one of those clients is the uh, render math ML token object uh, in, the, in the case of this POC, which can be freed by just removing the math element. And for whatever reason, when you do that and the render math ML token object gets freed, it isn't actually removed from the, the tracking list of uh, the CSS image generator value. So when uh, crossfade change goes to iterate that client list, it'll then use the dangling pointer in UAF. So it's a pretty easy to grasp lifetime issue. Um, surprisingly easy because it, it didn't really require any tricks to make it work. It just doesn't remove it from the list when it's freed. Um, that said, exploitation will be a little bit tricky here. The reason I say that is this is happening in the DOM, uh, in the web core. So for those not too familiar with WebKit exploitation, there's there's like heap arenas. Um, most of the interesting primitives that you can get to are going to be based on the JS core heap. This should be in the web core heap. Um, I'm not 100% certain on that, but I believe this should be. Um, so you are going to have to bridge that gap going from web core to JS core. Uh, it's also going to be a bit trickier to debug because you can't just throw this in, in JSC. Um, and, and just have it, you know, use that for debugging. You have to have like a full browser instance uh, to be able to hit it because obviously it's in CSS and HTML stuff. So yeah, um, it's a pretty easy to understand vulnerability. Might be a bit harder to exploit, but I have no doubt that you could take this to a like, you know, full read write. Um, it's pretty rare that you have 
a UAF of this nature and WebKit that you can't take to Arbreed, right? There's just so many things that you can, so many routes you can go. But uh, yeah, I mean, not too much to this report because it's a fairly straightforward bug. There is the Asan report and a uh, basic POC as well. Um, I'll quickly mention that there, I think there's people looking into this for the, uh, you know, the consoles, uh, which, you know, could be good for that specifically because it's not in like JIT or anything like that. Uh, which, yeah, it's just, it's been a while since I've seen a browser bug that we've covered that wasn't in like, you know, turbo fan or some kind of like JIT optimization stuff. Um, seeing something in DOM is, is kind of refreshing and cool to see. So yeah, it's been a while since we've seen DOM issues. I mean, was the meta for a while and then kind of moved on as bugs slowed up or dried up there. Kind of cool to see. Um, interesting to see it out from Maddie Stone, who usually she does the uh, like in the wild bugs, but I believe this was just her own bug with uh, fuzzing. Um, I was actually going to ask if you knew in the wild, but checking the tags, I do see it uh, being fuzzing. Yeah. So uh, cool find, and seems like it might be one of those cases where the CSS crossfade stuff. Um, or the math ML token or both are just not areas that have been fuzzed very heavily. Um, because if there's a bug that's this like low hanging fruit, as far as browser stuff goes, there's probably more stuff there too. Um, so wouldn't be surprised if we see more reports coming out of that area uh, soon. So yeah, uh, we'll get into some of our shout outs. Uh, actually, Z, did you want to get into the shout outs first? Or we also have a question that we wanted to um, do a discussion. On. I have the question set up before shout outs. Okay, so we'll do that first. So one question that we got in Discord, and it's not the first time we've seen it. Uh, I've, I've seen this question a few times, so we thought we'd cover it, is how important is uh, reverse engineering skill for Vuln research? Um, it's kind of an interesting question because obviously they're not exactly the same thing. They are different skill sets, but they can tie into each other depending on the situation. Um, so yeah, we thought we'd talk about it here. Um, in, so in the case of, you know, source code review, obviously, where you're doing like, you're not black box, you have access to the source, reverse engineering really isn't going to be relevant. Um, the only thing that might be a little relevant there is you might toss the binary into a dissembler to get some of the lower level info that doesn't show up at the source level, like let's say offsets and things like that. Um, but that's like barely RE, that's like surface level reverse engineering. Um, but when you start talking about more of the black box targets like Windows, uh, where, you know, the source it's, it's closed source, you don't have the code, the code for that. Um, reverse engineering does definitely become more important there um, to be able to understand the subsystems you're targeting, because uh, you have to understand what you're targeting to know what kind of assumptions to break for for doing VR. Um, and like RE is pretty important there, uh, though generally it won't be super difficult RE unless you're looking at like obfuscated code or something. So I feel like there's three buckets. You have like open source where you don't really need RE at all. You have closed source where you need to do RE, but it's probably going to be fairly straightforward RE. Um, at most, you'll be dealing with like strip symbols or something like that or, or strip strings. Um, and then you have like malware RE, right? Where you have obfuscation and anti reversing tricks in play. Um, so it kind of depends on which, like which bucket your target falls into. Um, VR and malware isn't like super common though. We have seen it for, you know, trying to kill like some viral, uh, malware or whatever. I mean, there's a, I think it's Melvon. Um, I'm just checking if that's the website right now. Yeah. Melvon, they like does hunt for vaults in malware. Um, like, that's just what they do. Uh, but that's reasonably uncommon. They're, like, you're basically, it's hack back sort of thing. Like, hacking the attackers. Um, there's kind of, with RE, there is also the realm of RE where it's just about source recovery. Um, which is, you know, to some people, the true RE. Um, I don't fall into that bucket. I mean, more generic than that. Another place where RE does kind of matter, even with Vuln Research, if you're going the fuzzing route, uh, when you get a Vuln there, you do still need a triage it before you get even to exploit dev. And exploit dev is kind of a different topic from Vuln research. But um, before you reach that, you do get your crash. Even when you're dealing with a um, 
open source project, you still need to, or you still may need to do a little bit of reverse engineering, looking at the disassembly to see how the code even got compiled or whatever at the time, uh, to kind of make use of that and figure out what's going on with the bug. It may not be obvious just from the code, or you may need to look at the code and get better insight that way. Now, could could be a few different things, but I'd say like reverse engineering is a very complementary skill. A lot of people doing Vuln research are going to be decent or competent with reverse engineering. They're going to be able to look at some disassembly and like make sense of it, but it's not necessarily the crucial skill. Um, unless you know you're doing the black box and specifically you're doing black box manual assessment where reverse engineer the disassembly and then you're kind of reading the code that you reverse engineer for uh, vulnerabilities, which is a longer and more involved process than most other forms of uh, VR. is something that gets done. You can find deeper bugs that way. Um, when it comes to the black box targets, like I think, well, I'd say, I'd say most bugs are found with fuzzing. That said, fuzzing just finds like a ton of bugs. So, you know, going by bug count isn't really a good comparison. And I know a lot of people that do the manual research on that and just look at the disassembly. So it's not like they don't do it. Um, and to be fair, even with fuzzing with black box targets, you're still going to have to do some reversing to figure out the interface, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's not completely alleviated, but there might be a bit less reversing with a fuzzing route than than doing like a full manual review. But yeah, I guess I guess what I'm getting at is the reverse engineering that you need for bone research for the most part isn't this super deep. I'm going to, you know, figure out all the compiler flags used and like rework the function or rework like what the source code was. It's more just like understand assembly be able to read that you know some calling conventions and kind of understand at a high level what's going on and then a lot of it i feel like is just you can learn as you go as you're doing it as you look at vulnerable code or whatever you can start noticing the patterns um easier to do from source code but you can do that from disassembly too it's a lot harder to do like the source sync tracing in disassembly at least in my opinion as the, the flow is is nowhere near as clear anymore but um yeah i'd say like it's important it complements it yeah i mean i don't want to say it's the most important skill but like it can be it's pretty important learning. it depends on what you you're doing yeah i mean it depends on your target really. yeah um so yeah just see which category you're your target falls into um, and you'll, you'll kind of have your answer for that question. Something that's a little related that we've talked about before is um, I think both me and you agree on this. C is like, if you're just getting into VR, I would recommend avoiding targets that require reverse engineering, like start with open source targets. Um, because when you try to mesh the skills together, uh, it does add more boundaries and, and more complexity to, your task and it's it's easier to get discouraged with with black box vr at least for me so yeah, if we we definitely agree there i mean my take would be uh one if you're just starting with vr learn to do it manually first and if you're going to do it manually re having a black box it's just this extra layer on top of what you're doing if you're going to deal with a black box binary no source what you're doing is you're going to kind of mentally be reverse engineering it back into source code and then doing that same source code review on what you've reverse engineered. So it's just that extra layer uh, that you kind of toss on there. It's not... So when you're learning, focus on one skill at a time. Uh, so yeah, we both definitely agree there. Of course, if you're motivated, really motivated on this one target, you're going to do that no matter what. Fine. Yeah. Do what you're motivated to do, because motivation is a big killer, too. Motivation is like the most important aspect, for sure. Um, you know, if, if you're if you're not motivated and you're not having fun doing it, uh, not only are you going to be miserable, but you're probably not going to make a lot of progress either. So, yeah, try to try to keep your motivation as high as possible, I guess. And for a lot of people, I think trying to do VR and 
um, reversing at the same time when you're new to either or both is, you know, going to going to discourage. Uh, Merculus asked, how much programming experience should you have before getting into finding and exploiting bugs on Python new? And we'd like to get into some cool exploits down the road. Um, you should know like the basics. So if you're talking about memory corruption, uh, you should know C, you should know how memory is managed uh, and like the types of bugs and the bug classes that can be involved there with memory corruption. Um, if you're talking about like higher level logic bugs, then I think you just need to like have a decent understanding of the language. You don't really need a, a ton of the knowledge of under the hood stuff. Language um, is so how apps are built. Um, that too, with the yeah. high level stuff, just understand what your target's doing and how it works. Um, don't need to have a full understanding of it, but with higher level issues, you know, bug bounty, uh, web app, uh, it's really just like understand the type of application. If you're going to target a chat app, be able to like not necessarily recreate it, but like know what type techs are or technologies involved with that. Um, and you can usually start finding issues. Memory corruption. I I slightly disagree with you. Um what you mentioned uh was bug classes. Um, and of course you need to know bug classes. Very important. You can't just do it without, but I feel like the bug classes are something you get exposed to over time and you really learn as you go. Um, and so I wouldn't quite toss it into anything more than just like some basic bug classes as like the prerequisite and knowledge of or knowledge required before you actually get started with, because there are a ton of bug classes, There's a ton of ways things can get introduce and i feel like that's something you just gain exposure to and you can start off relative you, with relative little information um just understanding like maybe overflow and like array out of bounds access um yeah i guess i guess the way i should have phrased that is um you should have a bit of knowledge on corruption logic um like the types of corruptions that exist and then your your classes kind of inherit from that um so yeah, you don't need to know everything about like all the different types of corruptions that exist either, but knowing the basics, like you know, like you called out uh with out of bounds access and, and lifetime issues and stuff like that, I think having a base set of that is good for getting into VR. Yeah, like one of the big things I'd point towards is understanding the memory model that C exposes. Because when I talk about understanding C as like a prereq for exploit dev. I, or like VR at that level, I'm not talking about like understanding C as a programmer and being able to like be a really good C programmer. What I'm talking about is being able to understand um, the memory model and kind of the model of the computer and software that C exposes because these exploits tend, and these bugs tend to take advantage of that memory model. Uh, so that's why, like in Java or something, you just you don't have that same memory model. You don't have the same bug. So that's where C, just understanding memory management, understanding memory and stuff. That's what's important, not necessarily knowing uh, all the syntax of the language or something. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a bit of talk about uh, like AI for for RE uh, and ChatGPT. And uh, I suppose. Hey, uh, shiny Quagsire, see you in there. Um, saying that current machine learning wouldn't fare too well on on reverse engineering. Yeah, um, I did play around with ChatGPT a little bit for RE. Uh, well, more for VR, not so much for RE. Uh, it it can be decent for getting like some general tips or something. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's super well suited for that. Even like the code uh, stuff that. Um, uh copilot uses i don't i don't think you could really apply that to reverse engineering very well uh it's kind of a tricky thing to automate um not the it's reverse. been tried for a while but um so i will say there was um a gidra plugin recently put out um uh 3po or something oh no it had a tie oh, in with the that. star wars character and then gpt it was mixing those two words together there um and i forget That's exactly a good what it was called but what it did um is the way it worked is it would take your disassembly from ghidra and then at from that disassembly it would ask gbt to be like 
hey, what would you call this function? I did it kind of at a lower level. I wasn't doing the whole piece of software or something. Um, it was just doing it at like the functional level and giving you some information there. And it seemed reasonably decent. Not always right. Uh, that is kind of a challenge with uh, GPT in gen or with the AIs in general right now. Or They can be kind of confidently incorrect. We've talked about AI, but uh, yeah, somebody just dropped the link here. Uh, G3PO, yeah, protocol droid for Hydra. Looked kind of cool and seemed to do a decent little job at it. I'd have to play around with it more, but like, it's an application of AI, so you know, it's something. Yeah, um, I think it could be used for like some basic disassembly uh, type stuff. Um, if you're talking about trying to like deobfuscate though, or something like that, uh, yeah, I, I just don't think it'll really work there. So yeah, it, it's, no, an, it's, it's an interesting area, but it's not one that's been like, uh, it's just not really a great use of AI as it is right now. Yeah, key thing as it is right now, I could imagine AI being trained to do, uh, like the, the compilation or something, and might be able to do a decent job. Um. One kind of funny thing is it can deal with, like, if you're dealing with a a disassembly, it deals with that a lot better than just giving it, like, a hex stump and having it try and figure that out. Um, I've seen a few people who are, like, asking it to uh, reverse or even disassemble just some uh, hex stump, and it'll, like, make up instructions or it'll mix, like, <laughs> architectures and stuff. Like, it'll just make it up completely. But if you give it that, you know, it does seem to have, or sorry, when I say it, I am talking about the GPT-3 stuff and chat GPT, uh, because that's the one I played around with the most. It does seem to have some understanding about, like, the big structures. And that is kind of a thing that AI seems like it could somewhat be fitted or suited towards, is there is kind of a statistical um, uh, correlation between the disassembly instructions and the code that actually resulted in that. So I could see it being useful in the future, but not quite yet, or at least not anything that's publicly released yet. Yeah. Um, and yeah, for, for using it for things like identifying certain common functionality, like a, like a crypto hash algorithm, or maybe like RB tree stuff. Like I could see it being used for stuff like that for sure. Um, yeah, but that's also pretty easy to do because usually when it comes to crypto stuff, especially there's magic numbers. Um, and sorry, I'm just saying specifically on crypto because that was Bleeka's question. Uh, Elf, you're looking at MD5 or SHA1. Um, back, you've got the magic numbers, which are usually a really quick way to reverse engineer uh, a function doing one of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and also you could have like the the hardware acceleration, uh, like extended instruction set stuff that can be a pretty big tip off too. Um, but yeah, uh, stuff like ASN could get into tricky territory. Yeah. So it's an area that would, it'll be interesting to see if it can improve for something like that. Um, I think AI might be a little bit better for like, I wonder if you could use it for some VR on decompiled code. Um, because I did do some playing around, like we talked about this already, so I'm not going to go too, too deep into it, but like chat GPT can do some basic VR. Sometimes it does get it wrong. Um, like it'll miss stuff or it'll say something is a bug when it isn't, but maybe it could be leveraged, uh, like post decompile. I could see it being leveraged in that way. So I, I'm less confident in that. Like, yeah, there's probably some AI that can detect bugs and like, there might be the chance of that, but. I feel like, at least as it stands right now, a better play is disassembly to decompilation. Um, just given what <laughs> I've seen it do with decompiled code and just with code analysis in general, if you give it a well-known example of code that has like a well-known vulnerability, sure, it does fine. But anything subtle, it just goes off into that confidently incorrect thing. Um, and that's part of just how it works. Like, it's looking for that... Like, it's statistics ultimately with a lot of this especially gpt3 uh like if you actually use yeah it's a completion ai it's leading the text so it's looking for those statistical connections and it seems really smart but like it doesn't understand what it's doing so that's kind of a limitation at least with this tool. 
as I understand it, I am not. I've never done like AI programming. Serious level. Yeah, neither have I. Um, I think you have a little bit more knowledge on it from like academia, but I, yeah, I, I have not really touched it very much at all beyond just playing with it as everyone else has. So yeah, my AI class did not even cover like machine learning or any of this though. Oh, um, it enough. was right before kind of it really took off. Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much everything we can cover for that question. Uh, you know, quick TLDR. Um, it mostly depends on what your target falls into. Um, so, yeah, and it, it is a useful skill to know, but it's complimentary. It's not necessarily required. All right. Uh, so we do have a few shout outs in this episode as well. Um, one of which is learning eBPF exploitation. Um, that's extended Berkeley packet filter. We've covered a few eBPF uh, based vulnerabilities in the past. It's quite a big subsystem in the kernel and you know because it's like a vm uh there's a lot of attack surface a lot of complex functionality that can be taken advantage of uh this post i don't think covers like a specific vulnerability more just some of the backgrounds of it no no it's um, uh it's a ctf challenge um oh, so right, it CTF goes into yeah. exploitation has the vuln there has a bit of background oh no i gave it a read it looked decent um i did not give the whole thing a read it looked like it had a nice little High level overview there, along with looking at uh, CTF's um, eBPF vulnerability. So it's a starting place. I wanted to shout out because it, le it looked kind of decent. Yeah. Uh, our next shout out is a post on Chrome browser exploitation for uh, CVE 2018 uh, 174463. So it's a bit of an older CVE. Uh, it is a uh, turbo fan vulnerability uh, in the, the JIT compiler. It's a bit of a long read, but it does go into, uh, well, this is part three in a three-part blog series, I should mention also. Yeah, so we between covered, the three parts. Um, or sorry, we gave a shout out to the other two parts already. So finally part three. Yeah. So between all three posts, there's a lot of background information on V8 uh, and just browser exploitation in general. Um, but because it's a bit of an older bug and there it is like mostly background, uh, we didn't want to give it like full coverage. Um, it goes into your standard like address of and fake object primitives, which I've talked about before, and they're kind of like the building blocks for browser exploitation. Um, but yeah, it is there if you want to take a look and you're interested in browser exploitation. Uh, like I said, though, it is a bit of a long read and it will probably take you a bit to get through, especially if you're newer. That said, it does seem pretty accessible, uh, even if you're not super familiar with browser exploits. So yeah, yeah ton it's, of it's worth checking out of info within it for sure yeah um and then yeah the third shout out that i had here uh was just the off by one security they're another youtube channel i do some longer streams they've had like uh connor mcgar we've covered his blog I, we've definitely given it shout outs i think we've covered at least a couple things from it usually does or what well, we've covered at least really long posts um Kind of written for somebody who has no background in like browser exploitation to give them, you know, all the information, all that background rather than assuming you have it. Um, anyway, he's not on this episode. Uh, he's uh, already been on an episode of uh, Off by One. Um, this week they've got Chompy on there talking about reversing and exploiting complex vulnerabilities. Uh, so just want to give that a shout out for this Friday. Yeah, for sure. We we've covered some research by Chompy as well. She does some some really cool research and uh, has a lot of experience in things like kernel, um, and particularly we've covered most of like most of the stuff we've covered from her is IOU ring stuff. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, exactly like what kinds of case examples will be used uh, in this stream, but yeah, I mean she she's a she's a solid researcher. She does a lot of cool work, um, so. I'll definitely be checking out this stream. Uh, and I think anyone, uh, any of our listeners that watch the binary episodes in particular will probably find it interesting too. So yeah, definitely I mean, want to give uh, a shout out. Steven, sorry, I kind of start talking over you. Uh, Steven Sims also, I think. Uh, like just some random either. Uh, he, I believe he was the main author for uh, Sans 760, so like their exploit dev course. Um, yeah, like he knows what he's doing also when it comes to that. Uh, oh yeah. He also wrote, uh, or was co-author of a uh, gray hat hacking. If you're familiar with that book. 
All right. So that's all the shout outs that we have for today uh, and all the topics that we have. So thank you, as always, uh, to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VOD on Twitch immediately or on other platforms like YouTube tomorrow. Uh, we also have previous podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more links on Anchor, which you can find down below. Uh, if you want to join our Discord and follow us on Twitter, uh, links for those are down below as well or in the chat. And yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next week.